on being a professional scientist. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was ask if there were any questions from yesterday or the day before. The cases, afternoon discussions, um, it was actually quite humorous to sit and listen to you guys as you exited <laughs> and the comments were good. Um, what do you think? You made a hand gesture, so despite the fact that you're chewing, when you're finished, you get. How did the cases go? Interesting. That was. Okay. All right. It, I mean, is any of this? Has anyone been familiar with everything that we've pretty much discussed? I mean, that's pretty fantastic. If you are, I have to admit, you're like, I got it. All right, I, yes, excellent, thank you. <laughs> There's always one. Um, again, the purpose of this is to prepare you um, that if you come to these situations that at least you have some idea that you've run into them before. Um, by profession um, and training, uh, I do a lot of ethics consultations and um, my specialty is in research ethics uh, training and then um, review. And so one of the things that when I am talking to audiences in general is that there are really three goals in any kind of ethical situation and three points at which something can go wrong. The first is if you don't recognize the issue, right? So there are lots of times when we go on in our day and we're so focused that we're just not aware of what's going on around us. Um, we as scientists are very, very good at being focused. Um, but like most things, what's really good about us is also sometimes uh, gets us into trouble. So if we are unaware of our surroundings, if we're so focused on our goals and our research project and our dedication, um, we sometimes don't recognize the issues that are, that are present. And so that's the first thing that can happen when you're in a situation and a problem arises is that no one stopped and, and even recognized that it was going on. The second one is that you don't know how to deal with the situation, right? If you don't have the tools to analyze it, if you don't know who to ask, if you don't know how to frame the issue, uh, you don't progress. So you could say, you know, I have this really weird feeling, I, you know, this other person in my lab, and if your PI is looking at you like, I'm not really sure what you're trying to tell me. <laughs> um, despite you being aware of it, it needs to be communicated and it needs to get to the next level. And so, we want you to analyze these situations and feel comfortable using these things. The third one is to make a choice. So you may say, great, I've identified the issue, I recognize there's a problem, I could do A, B, or C, and if the way that you work through this, A is the best choice, the most ethical choice, and yet it's not so good for you, or it's not so good for your lab, um, there's not a whole lot we can do if you choose B or C. Um, but those are the three ways that it can break down. So you either didn't recognize it, you didn't know how to deal with it, or you decided not to choose um, the correct choice. Um, okay, so one of the things that um, Tracy Wilson Holland from the first day talked about was the Office of Research Integrity and uh, a program that they've developed called The Lab. I'm just going to play you the intro to it. Um, it's amusing, um, probably not for all the reasons that they want it to be amusing, um, but it, it's something that is out there. And so what we're really trying to do is just to give you as many resources as possible. I do not expect you to go back and look at this entire video, but if you were ever in an uncomfortable situation, um, I want you to know that it's out there and that they've actually done a pretty good job of discussing these things. So this is, um, the website for the Office of Research Integrity, it has tons of information out there. All right, this is where you go to find the regulations, things that um, you will be held to the standards and um, accountability for. Um, it goes through these four different people and comes across these different scenarios. It's kind of a choose your own adventure almost. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna play you just the intro and then I think that'll be good. It was a bad day. It started with just one reporter. Excuse me, Mr. Ross? Yes? Paul Williams Channel. Okay.
Sorry, how, how should I do that with the volume? <laughs> so that no one gets paid. <laughs> What's that? Do you have the volume down there? Or? I think I have it down here, but should I just not touch it and let you do it? You'll have to direct these questions to our general counsel. But Mr. Ross. Sorry, I have a meeting. A scientist from a competing lab decided to go public with suspicions that some very celebrated research from our university had been falsified. Promising research that it was hoped might lead to breakthroughs in the treatment of diabetes might not be all it first appeared to be. Paula Williams has the story. We don't hear much about the world of test tubes and lab rats until there's a major breakthrough with major public health implications. Add federal dollars and accusations of fraud to the equation, and you have a potentially explosive story. I was very interested in this paper. My lab's been doing very similar work. But it blew up pretty quickly. A preliminary assessment indicates there are grounds for moving forward and looking into all the research with which this individual is involved. But... And we've decided that further investigation is required to determine whether research misconduct has occurred. It turned out badly. Nine months after allegations of research misconduct, a young scientist here who seemed to have a bright future ahead of him has finally admitted to falsifying his research. The investigation turned up multiple instances of research misconduct by this individual over the course of a couple of years. Along the way, there were people in the lab who had questions but didn't speak up. There were people who had responsibility for oversight who didn't properly exercise that responsibility. There were people who knew what was right and didn't do the right thing. And... Is it true the McCrary family is withdrawing their commitment to establish a $30 million research endowment for your university? Well, yes. As you know, they made that announcement today. It just turned into the proverbial perfect storm. After findings of professional misconduct and with the mounting pressure of widespread bad publicity and more unhappy donors threatening to pull their funding, the principal investigator from this troubled lab who had been placed on probation has finally been dismissed. The PI was let go. His lab was shut down. Postdocs, grad students, lab techs, all scrambling to find a new place to continue their work. Many while dealing with the stigma that comes from a tainted lab. But you know what? It didn't really happen. Oh, I mean it did. But it didn't. Because with this program, unlike real life, you get to go back in time. You can become a, a grad student, a postdoc, a, a PI or a research integrity officer. You get a chance to enter an alternate reality as any of these characters. Walk in their shoes, experience their lives, and practice making the choices that will advance the integrity and in research. This outcome can be avoided. It's up to you to figure out how. It was a I don't think you listen to it again. <laughs> Um, okay, so part of this, I felt it like had a little law and order feel to it, um, which made me laugh. But anyway, um, part of this is an appreciation for how serious this issue is. Like there is a lot of effort going into getting you training that you're aware of these situations. Um, because we are finding that, that you're, you're not prepared. You don't necessarily always have the tools that you need to deal with this. And so this is why we do these trainings. This is why most likely later on in your career, you will be doing smaller groups and it'll be more targeted to the research that you do, but it's not something that it's kind of a checklist of, look, I checked out our lab beakers and we're all set and I've done the calibrations for the equipment and we wait until next year. It's, it's a little more active than that. Um, it's also a little harder to quantify. So 
Um, what I want to do now is um, pass this along to our next speaker, who's going to be is Isabel Sanchez Cumming. She's in charge of the IRB, um, the Institutional Review Board here at CASE. And um, she's one of the friendliest people I know. Uh, <laughs> she's wonderful. If you have any questions, it's um, always better to ask um, someone that's involved with human research, human subject research, um, when you begin to get an idea about it. So even if the majority of you are not doing it right now, in fact, I'm sure the vast majority of you are not, um, it's constantly changing in regulations. And if you work with tissue samples, um, and it has any kind of linked data, it could be de-identified when you're working with, with it right now, but technology advances, right? And so something that would have been de-identified may potentially be identifiable in the future, and then we're gonna have to scramble. So these are things that we, we need to think about and we need to at least be aware of. Um, as we get um, this transition going, if you guys wanna quickly grab coffee or something, we have about two minutes as we do this. Good morning, everybody. You guys look all fed and caffeinated. I don't think this is working. Is it? Yeah. Okay. 
Can you all hear me? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for letting me hang out with you on the last day. It's gorgeous outside, so I understand that attentions might be a little diverted. So I hope to make this as painless and as informative as possible. So please feel free to ask questions as you need to. Um, as Dr. Deming stated, I'm Isabel Cummings from the Case IRB, and uh, specifically we're the Social Behavioral IRB. And uh, what I hope today to talk about, just a little bit, just to give you some guidelines, not, a, not an elaborate history lesson, but at least some kind of roadmap of how we got to where we are and how it might involve uh, data and tissue repositories. I thought I would add this in as sort of the, what I hope is an informative icing on the cake to help you guys out because I am aware that most of you might not be engaging in direct human subjects research as you understand it. So I'm hoping that this will be helpful. So talking a little bit about a brief history, like I said, without making you think you're watching the History Channel, just to give you an overview of where, how far we've come. And uh, initially, these are the guidelines that got us all started uh, with the uh, Nuremberg Code of 47 as a result of the Nazi experiments and the, doctor, the Nuremberg Doctors' Trial. It was the first to codify things like informed consent and actually acknowledging that people, that when working with people, um, Suffering should be avoided at all costs. Believe it or not, that had to be written down. Um, then we move on ahead to 1964 with the Declaration of Helsinki. Many IRB still use this as well. Um, it's, an import, it's still an important document and it has lasted and morphed even today. And it is now the good clinical practices um, that, was kind of, that was changed in 2008. But ever since 1964, Helsinki had been revisited and updated. And it too talked about things like informed consent and uh, the importance of a human subject's uh, rights and welfare taking precedent over societal or scientific needs. That too had to be uh, discussed. The big one that we still use and refer to is the Belmont Report. It was um, uh, developed in 1979 and codified a year later. And now we move into current regulations. This is the Belmont Report. Uh, um, the principles that came out of the Belmont Report, the three ones, you probably read this or you were probably assigned to look through this, so I won't dive into this too much. But um, the three essential principles, basically you look at a stool, and then these are the essential legs of a stool. Without one, it pretty much falls and is unstable. And you have the respect for persons, beneficence, and justice principles, each of them being terribly important. Respect for persons talks about informed consent, that a human being has the right to know that they have a right not to participate if they don't want to, and they have the right to withdraw. Beneficence talks about the risk-benefit ratio, and we'll talk a little bit more about risks later, but basically the risk can exceed benefits. That's the most important thing. So if you want big risk, you have to have big benefits, although most IRBs wouldn't approve a big uh, protocol that's too risky. A justice. It's a little more uh, uh, nuanced but because it covers a wide range of things. It covers everything from the equitable selection of subjects, having an equal distribution. If you're having a back study, why are you excluding deaf people, for example? I've actually had a protocol like that. Or if, you're, if you need consent from visually impaired people, there's no reason why you can't obtain it. So justice really covers principles like that. And it also talks about bearing the burden of research that those who have to bear it should also be expected to, uh, bear the res to accept the results and to benefit from the results. So the, the common example people give for this is uh, poor people being experimented on for plastic surgery. There's a really, God bless you, there's a really good chance that folks who um, are impoverished can't actually have it. So why involve them in experiments? So that's the kind of stuff that falls under the aegis of the justice principle. So codified, how does it look codified? It's a lot, it's a lot of words and it's a big long code, big long code of things. It's 45 CFR 46 and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But basically the federal guidelines really tell us everything we need to know about, almost everything we need to know about IRBs. It's vague enough for most IRBs to sort of develop their own local internal policies, but it's clear enough that most IRBs look the same in many respects. It talks about board composition. We have to have a community member who isn't affiliated with the university at all. Excuse me. In fact, 
if that person is not present at a meeting and everybody else is there, all the faculty and staff, we don't have a quorum, we can't vote on anything, protocols can't be approved. So community members are really essential. They're also really hard to get and keep, but they're absolutely crucial. And they also talk about review categories. You've heard exempt, expedited, full. You heard the different categories under an exemption and the different categories under an expedited review. It's all governed by the code. Um, as well as institutional assurance of uh, uh, compliance. We have to have documents and submit it to the feds on a regular basis saying that we're an IRB, we're following the rules and guidelines, we're consider keep considering us a legitimate IRB. It also governs informed consent requirements and the informed consent requirements are really specific. Um, which is why when I have to talk to a researcher and say something like, I don't know how long the, uh, your activities supposed to last. The, the expected duration of activity is not listed in your informed consent document. And the researcher will say, but that's all you want me to change? And I'll say, yes, lucky you, you only have one thing to change, but it's important because it's federally mandated. The template that we have through our website is not, and I tell people all the time, it doesn't have to look like my template at all, but it does have to contain all of the elements therein because they're federally mandated and it comes out of this code. It also talks about when, to, when you can get a waiver, under what circumstances you can get a waiver of signature of informed consent, like an online survey, or when you can get a complete a waiver or alteration of informed consent, such as databases, such as databases with identifiable private information. And hold that thought because we're going to talk about it a little in a little bit later. It also talks about uh, vulnerable populations. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit later as well, but basically the feds have three specific, uh, 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 three specific subparts for vulnerable populations. Children, pregnant women, fetuses, and neonates, that's one subpart, and prisoners. The feds uh, were governed by, at least all IRBs in the U.S. are governed by what's called the Office of Human Research Protections. It's a division of the Health and Human Services Department, and they are the ones who provide guidances for us whenever we have a question about how to interpret the laws based on a local study or a local issue, we consult with them and they give us their guidances. They also release national guidances on a regular basis. In fact, the most recent ones they did involve a continuing review. Um, it's called the common rule in case you haven't heard that phrase. 45 CFR 46 is known as that because um, 18 federal agencies have agreed to comply with it. Now, I, I put this up here because some of you might have to go through biomedical IRBs. We, as a social behavioral IRB, do not uh, review or approve any protocols involving FDA-related or regulated drugs or devices. So anything from incubators, Band-Aids, toothpaste, gummy bears, I've seen those. That's why I can use them as examples. We can't review any of those because those involve the FDA. And so I would have to refer you to a hospital IRB. So my recommendation is when in doubt or if you know you're dealing with something like that, call any one of the IRBs within this community and uh, we'll tell you where to go because the com completing the application requirements, the processes are different are very different. So doing one does not mean you've successfully completed the application for everybody. So this is our, this is our case community. This is our research community. Um, case Western Reserve University works really closely with all of these uh, IRBs that you see. UH, Metro, uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, Cleveland Clinic. We all work together, we all have assurances, and actually our university compliance officer visits, every, has to attend every single IRB meeting because they often involve case researchers. Many of our researchers have do, joint appointments and have one foot, sometimes more than two feet actually, in many institutions. So we all stay, uh, we all stay close uh, contact with one another to discuss local and internal IRB issues. How are you guys going to handle this policy? How are you going to handle this researcher doing this study over here when they, in fact, belong over here? 
we have what's called an Institutional Review Board Advisory Committee, and we meet every other month. And it's a, it comprises of representatives from every one of these IRBs, and we all get together to talk about how the IRB processes are running, how can we help each other, how can we streamline the process. In fact, through the IAC, we actually ref we try to streamline the process where we try to restrict how many times you have to go through an IRB process. If you come through case, for example, the social behavioral one and you're, say, a university hospital uh, resident, you might not have to go through any other IRB in order to get an approval because UH accepts ours. So we try to use reciprocity and we try to make these processes, believe it or not, as painless and as trouble-free as possible. So you have six to choose from. And you saw five institutions, but Case Western Reserve University actually has two IRBs. We have a cancer one, and then we have the social behavioral one. Why are, while we are exclusively social behavioral, the Case Cancer IRB does both biomedical and social behavioral IRB reviews, as long as it's exclusively dealing with cancer. So say you have a data set from the American Cancer Society or from some any, any place, any other source involving cancer. If that's the case and you call me and say I want to submit an IRB, I would have to direct you to the cancer IRB so that they can, you can work through their process. You would not have to work through mine as well as theirs. You can work through theirs and you'll be fine. So you have those to choose from. Um, basically, the IRB is charged with this. We review, we review protocols to ensure that people are properly protected, that human subjects are protected. That's our job, that's our charge, as dictated by the common rule. So these are also coming out of the common rule, but it's important to talk about, so what's a human subject, what's risk, what's all that stuff. So basically, starting from, starting from scratch, and you all probably know this, is that a human subject is a living person. If you're working with, say, the Social Security Death Index, every, we're all assuming everybody's dead on that thing. I don't think they would mistakenly put someone living there. So if you're working exclusively with the Death Index, you're not working with human subjects because they're all decedents. So decedents, you don't have to go through the IRB necessarily, but if you think you're working with other indices that might involve living people and or identifiable private information, you need to contact the IRB in order to determine if you have to complete one or not. Did you have, you have a question? Is your hand up? No? Okay. I try to be really attentive to that stuff. You're like, oh, I'm, now, you, now you balled it up. You don't have to do that. But <laughs> I'm just checking. But um, so that's what a human subject is, a living person or, and this is important for database research, an identifiable private information. So let's say, for example, you don't want to talk to me specifically, but you want records on Case Western Reserve employees. So you want our employee records. Um, if you want private identifiable information, but you don't want to talk with any of us, you're still working with human subjects. So what's, a, what's, so what's research? Research has two essential components. It's an investigation, a, syst a systematic investigation, and it's designed to develop or contribute uh, to generalizable knowledge. This distinction, though it sounds really basic, is really important because for classroom exercises, say for example, Dr. Deming wants each of you to interview everybody in this room. So I, I'm very bad at assessing numbers, so let's say there's 40 people in this room. So everyone would have 39 interviews to hand in to Dr. Deming. Unless you want to publish or present, you don't have to submit an IRB protocol to me and wait for approval before you begin your research. If it's exclusively classroom exercise work or quality assurance, maybe you're hired to see how, how great this curriculum is. So if that's the case and it's just for Dr. Deming and her department, then it's not, we wouldn't consider it human subjects research according to the IRB rules and according to the federal rule because it's not developing or contributing to generalizable knowledge. So when in doubt, if, sometimes you might not even have to go through the IRB depending on what you want to do and for whom. So give us a call before you, before you begin to give yourself a headache on what you have to work out. We'll help you work that out. Risk, um, this is also, like I said, all of these are defined for us. Um, the probability of harm or injury uh, res uh, occurring as a result of participating in a research study. If someone falls on the way to your study, 
They're, it's, they're not suffering a risk from participating. Um, but for social behavioral studies, risks are very real. It's even though they're more nuanced. So a biomedical IRB informed consent, uh, by, uh, IRB approved informed consent would say something like, you run the risk of death, you can, you can get headaches, your tumor won't shrink, you'll have an allergic reaction to the experimental drug we're gonna give you. Something like that that's a lot more tangible and a lot more understandable. Um, social behavioral uh, protocols often are associated with these kinds of risks. Uh, things like emotional distress, say you wanna ask questions about drug use on the job, or how you discipline your kids and someone could inadvertently share that they're abusing their children, or Yes, I drink, I, I had beer during my lunch break, and they could stand the chance of losing their job if, if the data's released. Um, so these things are very real, and I try to point out that social behavior research, while not what people often think about, um, presents its own impact on people. In fact, uh, my, my famous example that I've given before involves um, a really innocuous study out of uh, one of our colleges that wanted to assess how people wanted to develop the city. Just how would it look? Waterfront development, neighborhood development. Those people ended up calling us, fearing that Case Western Reserve University in conjunction with the city wanted to evict them from their homes. So you never know what your human subjects will think when they see someone representing a large institution, asking if they want to participate in something. Everything you do and say, believe it or not, everything matters. Everything you want to collect is really important and it matters. So minimal risk. So minimal risk is the probability or magnitude of harm or discomfort is anticipated in research. And it's not greater in or and of themselves than those of ordinary daily life. So basically, the risks of participating in research cannot, involve, cannot exceed those experienced in daily life. And this is important because there's no such thing as a risk-free study. Sometimes people will say, no, there are no risks. And I'll ask people to, re to reword that to say there are no major risks to, to participating in the study. For most of my studies, it's no major risks, no direct benefits. But it's important to keep that in mind, particularly for international research. For international research, daily life and risks could be very different things. Um, for example, there are countries where women are safest in their villages, and if they walk outside of their villages, they could be abducted or raped or killed. So asking them to walk somewhere could be, God bless you, it could be a terribly risky thing to do. It could exceed the risk of daily life for these people. So in preparing a study, particularly working with a culture with which you're not familiar, it might say, for example, that walking experiment could be great in, in a safe suburb, but not in an inner city community or in a more dangerous area. I'm from an inner city community, so I, I, uh, I walk around where I live as opposed to where my folks live because I know the daily risks are very different in both settings. So just something to keep in mind. So how to minimize them. IRBs are not unreasonable people. IRBs know that research risks um, are reasonable. It's understandable that if something happens to someone accidentally, we don't expect it to be trouble free. We hope it's trouble free, and for the most part they are. But um, we don't expect any, anyone to say it's risk free because life isn't risk-free. So we totally understand that. So exemption, from the least amount of oversight to the greatest amount of oversight, we have what are called exemptions. And these exempted studies, um, it, they're deemed human subjects research, but they don't have to undergo greater scrutiny according to the federal rules and regulations. So there are six categories under exemptions. Four really pertain to us, because like I said, we don't deal with FDA-related stuff, and the last two have to do with taste and food. So researchers, however, at least for our IRB, some IRBs are different, but for the case social behavioral IRB, researchers are not um, uh, required to make exempt determinations. That is something for the IRB to consider. So we would ask you to submit a protocol, including your database studies that could be exempted, so we would ask you to submit a protocol, submit all of the information and documentation that go with it, and then we make the call if it's exempt or not. 
Exemptions can't be granted for FDA research, and this is for those of you who will be going to uh, um, biomedical IRBs and you're dealing with drugs or devices. Now, expedited review doesn't mean fast. It means faster than full. So uh, uh, this is the majority of what we do. About 90% of all of our studies undergo an expedited review. Um, we have local policies that affect what additional things we might ask of you, but basically this is the most common. There are, seven, there are nine categories under this particular category uh, of review, and we do this every week, every single week, all year long. Summers, I don't take summer breaks or holiday breaks. We do this all the time. Full review, this is mandatory, and this is where, as I said, the community member is really important because they have to attend in order for it to matter, in order for a vote to be able to be cast. So um, during full reviews, we meet monthly. If there's a protocol that requires full review, we meet the first Tuesday of every month. Our calendar and our deadlines are on our website. So if you think you're going to have a protocol involving that would need a full review, take a look at the calendar. It's usually two weeks. The deadline to submit to us is usually two weeks before the actual meeting date. So, and it is only at full where we can table and disapprove a protocol. So these are all of the criteria that the federal guidelines inform us uh, uh, that we have to always consider when processing a protocol. And these even apply to secondary data analysis studies. For example, privacy and confidentiality are essential when it comes to secondary data analysis studies. And even for informed consent, which we'll talk about in a second, if you're dealing with identifiable information, do you have the waivers that you need in order to, to get the information you want once we're approved? So there's a distinction between privacy and confidentiality, and people often interchange anonymity with privacy and with confidentiality, and people swap them all the time. But there are actually differences, important differences between privacy and confidentiality. Privacy referring to the, the physical surroundings. So for those of you who might engage in human subjects research, we would be asking you things like, are you going to interview them in a private room? If you want kids to complete surveys for you, will they be able to do it without somebody peeking over and looking, depending on what you're asking and what you want to collect? And those things will have to be spelled out in your application. Confidentiality is probably more important for those of you who are going to be engaging in secondary data analysis, because this is your obligation. This means this is the part, this is where you come in in assuring an IRB that you're going to protect these data that have nothing to do with you, but that you're going to secure them properly. And these are all the ways to do it through iron keys, servers, that sort of thing. We have all of our researchers tell us, if only in a couple of sentences, how are you going to keep this stuff confidential? If you're working with the laptop that your five-year-old nephew uses to play their games, that's wonderful, but are your data locked and secured from these really smart, intelligent kids who can break into anything anymore. So just, just a little bit about vulnerable populations. As, uh, as we, I stated earlier, the federal rule talks about three specific vulnerable populations. We've actually expanded um, what we mean by prisoners. So prisoners don't just mean incarcerated individuals. There we include parolees, probationers, individuals who are detained. Um, in the city of Cleveland, fetal and embryo research isn't permitted, so that's something I wanted to throw in with regard to subpart B if you wanted to engage in research like that. Um, with regard to children, we also include the cognitively impaired. We use a lot of the criteria that's under subpart B when working with groups like the cognitively impaired or the decisionally impaired, whom we also consider as a vulnerable population. We also consider vulnerable populations to be us, University students, university employees, because of the power difference. So we try to protect them as we do the federally mandated populations as well. So talking about uh, uh, databases and tissues, I know that a lot of you guys will be doing this kind of stuff, which I think is great. The, one of the most important things to understand, and, and I'm sure you all do, is that originally, there's a ton of data everywhere. I mean, there are 
I get calls about, you know what, I just found out that there's a bank of stuff here and there's a bunch of stuff we've been collecting for years and what can I do with it? And those are always really tricky questions because the IRB cannot, no IRB can grant approval retroactively. So it's really important that even if you're working with data or tissues only, that you consult with an IRB before engaging in the study, even if it looks like all you have to do is make a phone call and you get a CD. It's, it's a lot more involved than that. So we understand that there's a ton of data out there that's been collected over a long period of time. And originally, they were created for other purposes. So uh, uh, it is important to note that even those databases, if you want to access them for research purposes, you have to go through. They're also governed by the common rule, which means you have to go through an IRB. If for nothing else, for them to tell you, thanks, but you're free to go, you have to consult with an IRB first. As a rule, because you're dealing with, if, if you're dealing with identifiable information, you would have to go through an IRB. So these things are not, it's not a, a matter of, I'm not conducting interviews. I'm not doing surveys. I am nowhere near another human being unless it's a coworker. I don't have to do this stuff. If your stuff is identifiable and private, yeah, you do. You will have to. And they're living. Again, if you're working with decedent data, you don't have to. There are specific requirements uh, um, about how to store, use, and share that the IRB will ask you about. So even when you submit it and you say, I'm not recruiting or consenting anybody, you're still going to have to really talk about how you're going to store them, how you're going to use it, are you going to link it, are you allowed to link it. Some places, some data sources won't allow that. Some data sources, and, and this is all experience, some data sources insist you destroy data or that you return it. So other data sources don't even allow you to uh, uh, get an exemption from your IRB. Um, my famous example in that respect is uh, the Framingham Heart Study. They don't allow exemptions. Even if you're dealing with their de-identified data, they insist that you have an expedited review or higher. So when examining your data sources, take a look at, their, read their fine print, because they might have very specific provisions that uh, um, might be unusual, you, that you might need far more oversight than you need. But if you want their data, you might have to go through that process. So I threw up these, these terms because these terms are thrown up interchangeably. Database, registry, data bank, repository, tissue bank. They're all used, so what are they? So I'm going to try to at least try to make some sense of it for all of us. A database, like I look at a database and a registry as the book versus the library. So the database is a collection of, of data. It's a collection of variables. And uh, uh, in most cases, they're, they're electronic nowadays, but there are still many paper systems. And those are still under the purview of the IRB if they're identifiable. A registry or data bank is a collection of databases of more elements. These, like a repository or a tissue bank, uh, receive specimens or information and they're kept over a long period of time and they can be. Uh, Medicaid information, for example, CMS has a vast, a vast amount of data on people living and dead, Medicaid data, hospital data, personal information, diagnosis, how many kids they have, social security numbers, the whole nine. It's very detailed in many cases. So creating a database for internal purposes, for example, if Dr. Deming wants to create a database of every student she's ever had for her own purposes, it's not necessarily under an IRB purview. It's only if she thinks somewhere along in the future she wants to use it for publishing then she would have to go through the process of consenting her subjects and uh, going through this process of informing them and recruiting them and going through all that. So, but if you're just creating one for yourselves or for, like I said, for a classroom exercise, it's not necessarily an IR, it doesn't belong under an IRB. But again, think ahead uh, about the end product. If you suspect you're going to have what I call a eureka moments, and they happen. Sometimes you come up with this wonderful product that you didn't even anticipate. And it's kind of unfair to ask you to predict the future, but in a sense, you have to. If you think you're going to use whatever cool stuff you're doing now, 
for research purposes, before you engage in research or collect data, consult an IRB, get an approval or an exemption before you get started. Example of these, so I think this, these examples lend themselves to what some of you might actually be doing. Uh, uh, data from a, a, a project that identifies uh, cancer markers in identifiable human tissue. Um, originally they were stored for diagnostic purposes and now you found out about it and you want to access it. Perfectly reasonable, perfectly understandable. Those have to undergo and you have to go through an IRB for that. If you want to work with, and I actually get a lot of these from dental students and from nursing students, they want to access a medical provider's patient database. How can they access or look at PHI or get data for their, for their particular protocol? They never encounter a, a participant directly, but they're using all of their data, still have to go through the IRB. So what are we going to do with informed consent? So you're thinking, well, I can't. She just said it's secondary data analysis. How is informed consent coming into play? It, can, it has to come into play if you're dealing with identifiable private information. Identifiable private data, keeping, keeping in mind that a lot of these databases and repositories were collected and assembled, and nobody had research in mind. It wasn't even anticipated. So one of the ways to obtain consent, if you want to build one, like starting today, starting now, you want to do something with all of this new data you plan to get prospectively. Perhaps in standard treatments, or you want to work with a researcher or a medical provider to refine their informed consent document to include a provision about research. Get an IRB approval, have an informed consent document so you can start building a database that you can use for IRB related purposes, that you can use for research. So whenever it's possible, we, the, every IRB will encourage you to obtain informed consent. However, we know that it's not always the case. But again, read the fine print because sometimes your data sources will put a lot of unusual uh, uh, conditions on you before they actually give you the data. Or I'll give you this data, but you gotta promise me you're gonna do this and sign this data use agreement. So take a look at that before. So in the event you have identifiable data, let's say you have a thousand uh, employee records, right? Or a thousand records from Medicaid. So how are you, they're all identifiable, they're all private. How are you gonna get informed consent? You won't because you're going to ask the IRB for a waiver. You're gonna ask them for a waiver or alteration of informed consent. These are directly out of the rules. These are the, these are the uh, conditions by which we can grant a complete waiver or alteration of informed consent. For most studies, it's really hard to get. You know, we give more waivers of signature of informed consent, which implies you're seeing an informed consent document and instead of signing, you're hitting the I agree button. We do this all the time when we're online, whether it's for iTunes or for our bank. We hit I agree, we don't read it. Most people don't read it. You just scroll down so you can click the I agree button because you know if you don't, you can't get to the next page. So you've just been consented. Even if you didn't read it, they, they practiced due diligence, they did their job, they consented you. Whatever we want to do as far as reading it or not is up to us. But we're not asking for that because in these cases or in database cases, you're not encountering anybody ever. You're literally just getting data. So we have what's called a waiver alteration of informed consent means you're asking the IRB for permission to completely forego an informed consent process. And because informed consent is sacrosanct, to ask for that, you have to go through these little bit of these hoops in order to justify that you need it. So if you believe that your, your study, it apply, you know, this applies to your study, you meet these criteria, apply for a waiver. You'll get it. There's a good chance you'll get it. You meet them and you can justify and explain, you'll get it. Just to touch on HIPAA just a little bit, um, under the rule, 
the fe this is also a federal guideline. So under the rule, you have to ask for uh, um, authorization, HIPAA authorization. And the IRB approves this as well. So on our website, we actually have a PHI document that you can actually download and use. It has the federally mandated language. Again, it's not our language, it's their language that you have to use. Um, however, keep in mind that, um, that even if you want to look at decedents, information, de-identified, limited data sets, uh, HIPAA, HIPAA might come into play. So don't be surprised if I can give you a waiver uh, it, it, that you have to address both informed consent and HIPAA separately. However, just like with informed consent, you can ask for a waiver of HIPAA authorization. Um, and that may, these are very specific, bullet two specifically, these cover the exact things that you have to address when applying for a waiver of HIPAA authorization. Again, these are not our requirements, these are federal requirements. If you can adequately discuss how you plan to protect it from improper use, do you plan to dis discuss how you're going to destroy identifiers, they actually want us to ask you that. So you also have to talk about how it's impracticable, not impractical, how it's impracticable to do your research without a waiver or to do your research without access to PHI. You have to provide those additional explanations for that. And these are all important contacts for folks to, and I'm sure this is going to be available um, to all of you, this presentation. And uh, so these are all here for you to contact us. Do not hesitate. When it comes to IRB related stuff, there's no such thing as a dumb question. This prevents a lot of headaches and a lot of heartache. I've had researchers over the years come in with their fantastic work already completed, but no IRB approval. And that's the worst thing in the world to tell a researcher they can't use their data. So um, please call when in doubt. And if y'all have any questions or concerns, we can ask them now, or if you like, I'm always available to meet with folks one-on-one. -on -one. You're welcome to come to my office at any time. I have an open door, open phone policy, so feel free. And that's it. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, sorry, I'll just talk first. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So any questions? <clears throat> um, do, you, do you have any stories to tell? Otherwise, I'm going to. Um. just had, as I said before, I just have too many students come in crying their eyes out because they, they did all of this work and uh, they couldn't use any of it. So when in doubt, even if you feel that you're responding to the needs of your researcher or your lab, when in doubt, please call. And uh, I'll meet with you confidentially. We can talk about it. We can talk about how it is you can protect your data. Um, but don't, my biggest, I, if nothing else, if nothing else, call before you engage in a study. Call before you think you have to do anything. It's really important, even with secondary data analysis, it looks innocuous if all you're getting is a disk or a, a big fat uh, pile of papers with data variables on it. If it's identifiable, it has to undergo an IRB process. That's the most important thing. Okay. So, um done this all um, in smaller groups. I'd like you to actually, as a collective, do this one. All right, so. Um, and make this, make this apply to you. So I want you to describe your situation, all right? If I, we've used these examples of they're doing um, graduate work, something like this, I can use the description of a friend. All right, so just imagine this is not you that is doing this, but your friend is coming to you to seek advice. What they're saying, I'm going to be your friend. All right, <laughs> we'll just make it easy. Um, so here's my situation. Um, I have a mentor, and um, as part of my master's 
degree, I have to do independent research, and um, during it's a two-year program. So during the first year, they kind of match you up. You've actually met them. They're very good with networking. They work with a variety of hospitals. And so it's one of those, they're like, well, what are your interests? So I decide to choose um, multiple sclerosis. I think it's interesting. I hadn't known anything about it, but um, I like um, neuroanatomy. It was one of my favorite courses in undergrad. And so I decide to pursue this. So I go, and there are tons of different uh, aspects of this research, but I have a pretty limited time. And so I'm talking to my mentor, and they're like, well, why don't you actually interview the staff, OK? So interview everyone who cares for the patients and um, see what they think are some of the issues that arise, what are the challenges, so that you get a better understanding of, of what the environment is. And I'm like, all right, OK. So I go to the entire department, all right, and all of these individuals that have these weekly meetings that deal with patients with MS. And we have interviews. We, we talk for one, two hours. Um, there's a particular um, social worker who could talk for four hours and is fantastic and a wealth of information. Um, so there's a lot of great things that I'm learning. Um, I go to my mentor, who is um, one of the uh, individuals that leads this, not only within the department, but actually is in charge of several different organizations that are across um, several states. So it's pretty cool. Um, very well respected in her field. And I ask her about, all right, well, what about this IRB approval and do I have time to do this or who would I go to because I'm at a different university and you're at a hospital and wh what do I do? And she goes, no, 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 don't worry. It's quality improvement. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? What, you know, I just had this discussion. I now come to my friend and I say, what does quality improvement mean? Quality assurance? I mean, she kind of used both of them. Just anyone? Yeah? And words, you can't publish. I can't publish. Okay, well, it's for a master's. I mean, it's an educational purpose. And she actually said that there were some quality improvement journals that I could do. Oh, sorry. Okay. What about in a quality improvement journal? Hey. Okay. Well, you wouldn't have to go to the IRB as well as it's If it's quality improvement, then you wouldn't have to talk to the IRB. Okay. All right. Well, and she said, she's like, this is straight on quality improvement. Like, that's really cool. Um, so I kind of go forward. And I, I talk to her again. I'm like, all right, well, this is what I'm getting. And I would present it to my you know, master's department, and we have this huge um, event at the end of the year where you basically present to the faculty of 15, and it's you and them. <laughs> and then they grill you <laughs> about your research. And I use the term research, and she's like, quality improvement. I'm like, oh, OK, thank you. All right, so my quality improvement project and all that I've learned. And she goes, all right, all right, so that, this is it. I, I really think we'll be OK. We can certainly call them and ask them, and why don't you call why don't you call the, the IRB and, 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 and talk to them? So what should I tell them? Like, what are some key elements that you think I should get across? One of the things they ask me is, are you, you know, working with patients? I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm just, I'm talking to the, set, like, the, the doctors and people that care for the patients. I'm not talking to the patients. And they're like, OK. Well, will you hear anything about it? Well, they're going to talk in like vague information. And I'm actually going to be in the clinic. But I'm a student, right? We have students all the time like going through things. And if a patient didn't want me there, I would walk out. Is there anything else that you think the IRB would want to know to kind of determine what was going on? What's the purpose of the data collection? I don't know yet. So um, basically, it's to kind of map what the opinions. So what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about is that it's about the opinions of um, the healthcare providers and some of them, the challenges that they face in dealing with patients with MS. So each population of patients is a little different. Um, and this seems to be a particularly challenging one from what I've learned because patients with MS have judgment, um, er like problems making judgment. So traditional like competency tests are based upon patients with Alzheimer's. 
right? And so if you asked a patient with Alzheimer's, you know, are you sick? They would be like, no, or they wouldn't be able to identify their disease. Whereas if you ask a patient with MS, tell me about your disease, they can go on and tell you everything about it, but then they might decide to buy their family, you know, thousand dollar grills and not have money for the rest of the year to pay rent. Or so it's just they make judgment errors. And these are some of the examples that they use. So I'm, I want to focus on some of what they identify as the issues regarding caring for this patient population. Yes? Okay, well how this came up is that I actually attended some of the, the meetings that this group does and they're a very cooperative group, all right? So it crosses disciplines, it's, it's this, they're very vocal as well. <laughs> um, and some of these times, these meetings are supposed to be like an hour long and they just go on and it's because people have these stories to share and it's all very interesting but this is actually part of them requesting that I do this. So it feels a little more like this will be a benefit to them. They want to know, you know what the other people think. They just don't necessarily have the time or one individual that they can really say, go and you know, talk to everybody else because they're all very busy professionals and I'm this student that's like, I can do that. So if I... Okay, all right, so I, I end up talking to the IRB a little bit more, right? And it ends up that they're actually in a very um, busy time and I kind of leave them messages and then I send them a couple emails and it, it's very abbreviated, it's not very organized. It's not at this university <laughs> where they're very, very organized. Um, but anyway, I, for some reason, through my discussions with my PI and everything, she kind of says to go ahead and, you know, have the interview scheduled on, make sure you do this, keep notes, make sure it's de-identified, make sure you never write down someone's name, uh, never refer to a patient. Um, as we're going, though, I'm, I'm, you know, recording this information, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to see some very cool stuff. And some of the physicians, these neurologists, are actually bringing me into the rooms. And they're like, love you to meet this patient and talk to them. And I'm like, hi. <laughs> um, and I was like, I am a student. I am not a physician. I am not going you know, even to medical school. Like, I'm just you know, following them to understand this disease. And they are just excited to talk to me. They're like, let me tell you about this. This is my issue. This is what's going on. Um, I'm so glad you're taking an interest in this. I wish more people did. And I kind of talked to you and I was like, I felt really awkward. So now I'm back in the friend position and I'm talking to my friends. And I'm like, it was really, really cool. It was really, really kind of uncomfortable, right? You're like, most people don't get to do this, right? I mean, we traditionally don't barge into like, Again, I deal with a lot of medical students, so I traditionally can't say this, but we don't traditionally just wander into rooms and be like, hi, how are you doing? What's your issue? <laughs> um, and hopefully they don't do that in those words either. But again, they were nice and open and the patients were willing to speak to me. Does, I mean, what would you recommend to me again? The patient said it was okay, the doctor said it was okay. I'm the only one that's like, eh. Ooh, um, masters, like I just want to graduate, let's be honest. Like, <laughs> at this point, I have been talking to the IRB for like six months. I have been, like I was so proactive. I found my mentor like four months into my program and it keeps kind of changing, all right? So I think it's developing into something cool and then I kind of get pushed in another direction because they're like, no, 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 no. That, that's too close to research. and. You know, keep it day identified, keep it kind of loose, but then I'm not getting necessarily the information I want, so I, you know, become a little more targeted. Um, meanwhile, my mentor is actually traveling all over. So I'm, now I just really, really just want to, like, finish my degree. And in the meantime, I decide to enroll in a course on research. Um, 
ethics and regulations. And um, I do this. And they are talking about IRB submission. And um, this other professor is like, you know, come up with an idea. What, do you, what is your idea? And I bring my proposal to her. And she's like, this sounds great. You should definitely submit this. And I was like, ah, uh, really? I, I should submit it, because I thought it was quality improvement. And she's like, well, you don't make that determination. That's something that the IRB makes it a determination, and then they tell you about it. And I go, oh, OK. So I end up um, going to my chair and saying, I think I have an issue. So here is what my mentor told me. Here's kind of how we stumbled through this for the past eight months. I actually don't talk about going into the patient room. I think I don't want to bring that up yet. But I do talk about kind of the issue of, well, is it quality improvement? And what was my idea as it developed? Because it did change. Like, it changed several times. Um, and so they're like, wow, OK, well, you do need um, approval. And so what's going to happen is um, you either can re-interview all these people. Um, you can't use your previous data. You go submit your application, see what happens, re-interview them, and then, um, then you can do it. Uh, meanwhile, I'm supposed to graduate in two months. And this is a requirement for my degree. So I'm going to call y'all <laughs> and be like, I um, would like to go get some margaritas. Would you have some time? <laughs> Because some, some things have come up. And I feel completely um, embarrassed, I have to admit. Like, I am you know, supposed to know this stuff, right? This is, this is one of the things that I'm supposed to be doing and aware of. And we talk about all this. Um, my department's absolutely fantastic. They're like, listen, you're doing research on these other two projects. Take this data set. You are already, like, it is IRB approved. You are already listed as study staff. Take it, run, analyze it, and basically I spend the next six weeks of my life doing this, all right? Ends up, you know, create a, a paper, it gets published, I graduate. Um, that other project, I end up submitting to the IRB, and um, two years later, fly back to my graduate program, because by then I have moved on, re-interview everyone, and then um, have to deal with the IRB and all these different regulations at my new university as well as my old. Okay? This is my story, by the way. Like, this happened to me with my graduate program. Um, some of that was a little um, not right on the truth, um, but the gist of it is true. All right? I was doing a master's in bioethics, all right? Medical history and ethics. This is something that. These individuals did phenomenal training. Um, but a lot of it does depend on the mentorship and being attentive to the issues in a timely manner. All right? It was a very unfortunate situation. Um, they were great, but this stuff happens. Um, during a, a meeting very recently, we actually had another graduate student that was in a very similar situation as the one that I was just in. Um, and again, this is a couple months ago. Um, she had actually created this incredible project, had gotten awards for it, um, submitted it for publication, and um, then came to us for approval. And she had to withdraw her presentations from the conferences, uh, say thank you for the award, but I can't accept it, and she had to start over. All right, these are not easy situations. Um, and again, I don't think that she is a bad person. I hope <laughs> that I was not a bad person um, when this was going on. It's, it's just something that occurs. And the reason that we're here is so that we try to not make it happen again. Any questions? OK. Um, we have about a 15-minute break. I'm going to call to see if the other presenter can come a little early. Um, if not, um, we'll, we'll stay tuned. But in the meantime, come back around 10.30. <laughs>